So uh, I know Jake did this last night, but can I get a show of hands of how many people have transit on their phone? I love that. Wait, can you do it again? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so for those of you who don't, uh, now's the time. Go download it. You can skip about five minutes of this. Uh, just tune out for the next five minutes or so. Go download. We'll, we'll get you back in at the end. All right. So transit, everyone here knows, A to B without your car, not just uh, public transit, ride share, car share, all at once, one great, big, beautiful app. Um, we get to update this slide every time, and I like it because it means that we add just a, a little counter in the middle. So now we're at 50 employees. We've been going at it for a little bit more than six years at this point. Uh, we're the number three navigation app in North America. Now, why would you put something up on the slide that says we're number three? Usually these things say we're number one. We say this because number one is Google Maps and number two is Waze. Um, and so if you take a look at people who aren't driving, we're number one. Uh, this is the other one that the animation grows time by time. We're in 200 metropolitan areas uh, over North America. As uh, Jake mentioned last night, 99.5% uh, of all trips in Canada uh, are within transit app and of people who are using it, um, of, of people who just today, 16% of the people who use uh, public transit in Canada today will uh, use it by using transit app. So we effectively become the interface for everything that's going on. I'm going to zoom through this because of that show of hands, so you just saved yourself a couple minutes. Um, our, our, our home screen has our, um, everything that you've seen, it has all of the various little dots there being the scooters and bikes and all of these dockless things that are coming out, as well as our instant trip planner so that uh, it'll show you that uh, you're going home in 22 minutes without ever having to click anything. Obviously being able to track trains and buses in real time is a key functionality of what we're doing using all of the data that is so wonderfully provided by all of our agency partners. And our multimodal trip planner uh, means that you can um, combine all of these different modes and especially in regions where there are lots of different agencies. You don't have your own trip planner for each agency. You're combining everything together, including uh, modes that aren't necessarily put out by the agencies themselves. Uh, show hands for how many people who've used Go. All right, so now you have something to do later. Um, so Go is our, our trip companion. It's really great if you're traveling, if you don't want to have to think about it. It whispers in your ear uh, gently when you should leave, and it will also tell you when you need to get off the bus, uh, give you that sort of basic directions. Uh, the best part about it, though, is that while you're doing it, you're providing that real-time data back to everybody. Um, so that position and, and those locations, we're using it, we're matching it up in real time, and we're making sure that over time, we're actually we're, we're able to improve um, the customer experience just by doing that. Ton of data behind it. In transit, um, and you may not know this, depending on, on where you use it, you can uh, buy a bike share pass, unlock a bike, book a car share, request a, r a ride hail. You have uh, the whole gamut of things that you can do uh, while transit at its core, it's not just transit. Um, and these numbers add up over time. So we've got uh, more than 2 million bikes which have been unlocked through transit uh, over the last couple of years, as well as over a million dollars worth of passes that have been purchased in transit, which meant that people didn't have to leave one app. They had, their main mode could be transit, but they could continue to use bikes uh, and other modes as complementary. We've also introduced uh, Transit Plus, which is our multimodal trip planner. Um, it's great. It means that you can not only do one mode, you can combine them. Um, so it's a, a Lyft or an Uber to uh, a rail line. Uh, coming quite soon, we're also launching multimodal with uh, scooters and bikes, which means that you'll be able to plan a trip which has you take a bike to a bus to a bike at the end. So really allowing that to serve as the first mile, last mile. Um, and I'm not going to go too far into this because uh, Tim will be doing that in uh, one of the next sessions, um, but now you can buy transit tickets directly through transit and with our partners at Masabi, um, you can do that anywhere if you just come and talk to them. Um, so, what does this mean for us? So, uh, many of you in the room were partnered with. Uh, we partnered with more than a dozen agencies in Canada um, and, and many south of the border. I still like that joke. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still American. I'm getting used to it, but I, I appreciate it if, any, if no one else does. Um, there we go. Um, and, and just want to take a quick note here that um, although we partner with agencies and we become their endorsed uh, app, 
what that means is that there's still a panoply of data that's out there. We still, we, b we believe in open data, we believe in open APIs, we're built off of the fact that agencies have been generous enough to publish and maintain their data over the course of the last six or seven years, and we understand how revolutionary that's been, and so when you partner with us, that's not something that we ask you to, to give up. In fact, that's something that, that we support, um, because it, it is what allows us to exist. Going quickly, when we partner, you have a little geolocalized section, which means that you can customize the app to some extent. Um, we also provide communications tools, uh, push notifications, as well as targeted banners in order to improve the customer experience. Um, now we get to this. And then there's the data. So that was the whole lead up to get here. Um, so we're, we, a, a big part of our offering is by partnering with us, um, you get to see all of this data on how people are actually using um, transit that you don't get to know, that you don't know from your vehicle systems, although that's great data, that you don't know from, um, you know, from your fare card system, from all the other systems that you have, you get to see how people are actually taking their full journeys. It's big data. Um, so, what's important about data is how people use it. Um, that's interesting. Um, we've got 900, so, so the, the size of the data matters. We, there's, if you take a look at transit um, in Canada, there was 905 uh, million user sessions last year. So that's a big pile of data. That's a, a big, big thing in the user session is, is when they open the app and then they do a whole lot of things. So uh, we were doing a, a query yesterday experimenting with a new system and you know we're querying a couple billion records just looking at the last month um, so you're taking a look at a lot of different parts of user beha uh, user behavior and what I want to run through quick is the thing behind the scenes not how the app works but what we're looking at behind um, and uh, you know the term that I, the term that I've heard is uh, data exhaust and that's essentially what this is right this is the data which is left behind from really what we're trying to accomplish here, which is how do we get users from A to B in the most seamless way possible. So when the app is open, um, and when it's used in the foreground, and if you've given it permissions, uh, we know where the user is, we know what routes they're seeing on the screen, uh, and we know what they search for. When they go and plan a trip, we know where the user is at the same time. We know where and when they are coming from and going to, uh, what routes they return, and then what routes they choose. Right? And so you can think about the implications for being able to understand the choices that are presented to a user and then what they're doing based on the time and based on the actual, wh what they're actually seeing, right? Because when we produce all of this scheduled data, there's a, a theoretical user and these theoretical use cases that you're building for. But this is the actual use case. This is what they're seeing. And because the trip planner is a real-time trip planner, it isn't what the schedule says. It's what the user is seeing. So if you've got six routes that are, you know, falling 15 minutes behind or are bunched up, the user is going to see, well, they've got two trips in two seconds and then they don't have another trip for 25 minutes and they may be presented with an entirely different option. And beginning to understand that can, can change the way that you think about the things that you use from some of your products around service control. Uh, it may change that. Uh, so when using uh, the Go functionality, not only do we know where they are at a moment in time, we know that full trace of the user's journey. We know where they're coming from and where they're going to. Um, obviously, in order to, to position that back anonymously, we know uh, the location of their device. We also know how many riders they're helping, and that's one of the things that we use to redisplay that information uh, to our users. Um, if you've used Go, and for those of you who haven't, I'm going to give away the secret. At the end of it, it tells you how many users you've helped, and then it makes you hit a button that says, I am awesome. Um, and this is the number that we add up in terms of their awesomeness over time. Um, and then when using other services, we also know where requests originate and end. And this is really interesting because through transit, you're not just using your public transit. You're not just using the agency services. You're also using this whole other set of services, whether it's bike share, whether it's uh, ride hail. Um, and then you can begin to understand how are my services interacting with these services and when are people requesting them, all within the limits of what we can share with data. And then obviously with booking tickets at the end, it's uh, where, when, and how much that journey costs and how that's interconnected to all those other pieces. So 
I want to hit upon some of the issues that the keynote speaker talked about this morning and talk about them a little bit more concretely uh, rather than ethereally. Uh, privacy is a, is a huge issue. It is um, a sort of a, a coming problem, I think, for this industry as a whole because to some extent we have been late to the game in terms of all of the data that we collect and thinking about how we use it. And because we're late to the game, our security practices are not necessarily amazing. Um, and we're trying, we've been trying to play catch up for a long time as an industry. And we've been trying to play catch up by getting more and more data and thinking about it more and more, but not really thinking about the importance of that data. And where people are, their mobility data, is about the most sensitive thing that there is. If I know where somebody is, I can know when they're not at home and cause a burglary. I can stalk them. I can do all of these horrible things. A little bit of a downer. I apologize for that. Um, and so it's important for us when we think about how we use this to have that promise to our users as an app company that they are not going to have this data misused in any way, shape, or form, that that trust is something that they can have in us. Um, and a big part of how we do this is by not requiring people to have any sort of accounts, um, not requiring people to log in, not requiring you to give up your personal information in order to use the app. You can use it in an anonymous fashion. We're not going to track you using your Facebook tag manager or Google or anything like that. That's not the point of what we're doing. The data isn't exhaust, it's not the primary point. The primary point is to help people out. And as long as we keep that promise together, then we can be successful. There is some exception. So when you do need to purchase a ticket, when you do need to unlock a bike, we do need to get some amount of information from you. Um, and so when a user has an account because they've signed up for these services, we have this personally identifying information. But we take significant protections in order to make sure that that isn't problematic. So we don't know or store the payment data ourselves. We use a different party. We do, and we use significant encryption in ways that, quite frankly, I don't even quite understand. Uh, we don't know the user credentials. And the user's personal information itself is kept encrypted in a way that we can't see it. It's kept separately from that mobility data. So it's kept separately from how they're traveling so that that personal identifying, personally identifiable information, even if something were to happen, couldn't be connected back to the mobility data. And it's not shared with anyone ever, no matter how much you ask for any reason. With mobility data, that doesn't contain any um, personally identifiable information. At the same time, it does include a, div a, a device identifier. Right? And that di device identifier, even though it doesn't say, you know, this is David's device, is something that you can use to track over time. Um, and if you're able to track somebody's movement and mobility over time, then with 10 other data sources, even if you don't know who that is from that particular set of data, you can eventually begin to, if you're malicious, tie that data back. So it is still an incredibly um, important thing to keep close to our vest uh, just as, as a whole for the industry. Uh, so we control access to this information uh, very tightly. Uh, we do share it. Um, we share it only with our uh, research partners and with agencies that we've partnered with. Um, and one of the reasons that we do that is because uh, we know that those partners have to be able to meet those same standards for security and what they're going to do with it. And there's two parts of that. So one is, can they actually keep this data safe on a, a, a purely technical level? But the second piece of it, is this anywhere close to the intent of what the user was doing when they signed up for the app? And you can have users agree to anything in a terms of service. Um, how many of you have ever read a terms of service from beginning to end that you weren't responsible for writing or approving in some way? Exactly. So you could have anyone agree to anything in a terms of service. So rather than, do, rather than having that be the thing against which you must abide, you really have to think about, can, is this the user's intent in what they were doing? And given that our app is called Transit, and given that we're pretty clear that we partner with transit agencies, uh, sharing that data with our partners seems to be a very natural thing and is within that user's intent. 
I just like that it looks like the matrix. Okay. So closing up and getting to what we're actually doing here with some of the value. Maybe. Okay. Uh, advantages to using the data that comes from an app like transit, which is different from what we typically have. Um, it's not just how people interact with the network, which is how fare card data works. It's where people are actually coming from and going to, um, which means, and people who aren't necessarily interacting with the network or choosing not to. So you're seeing a significantly different set of data. It's obviously a much larger sample than you get um, from surveys. Imagine being able to survey 16% of your customers every day. Um, that's not something that is typically, you know, it's a survey maybe once every five or 10 years of a very large sample of your customers. Uh, it's repeated use over time, so it's not just yesterday's or frequent travel. So it's a very different and uh, different set of data in terms of how people are moving around. Um, and it reaches some of those, the audience, it's incredibly difficult um, to reach, uh, specifically tourists and infrequent users, which can be really difficult to understand their movements because any of your survey data isn't necessarily going to have it. Um, but big data, um, and I've been using that term now for the last uh, 15 minutes, I, I really dislike that term. Um, it, it really has nothing to do with the size of the data. It really does have everything to do with what the application is and, and what it matters for. So I wanted to end with this because I think it maybe can help start the conversation in the, in the 10 or 15 minutes that we have, uh, have left, which is, when you should use this data, I think, is one of the more interesting questions. What does this matter for? Um, and I think that there are, there are two main categories that we're talking about here. Uh, the first one is a little bit more research-oriented. So that is to answer previously um, unanswerable questions. And, and these are interesting questions, um, but maybe not necessarily all that actionable. So how far are people walking to get to your stop? You have some basic ideas, but you, you don't really know. And what does that mean for their frequency of usage? Um, and how long are people waiting at their stops? How much has real-time data and you know the, the ability for people to, or scheduled data, if you don't have real-time data yet, changed when people get to bus stops? How much does it matter if buses are delayed? How does that interact with your control systems for buses and your CAD systems if you know that as long as you're providing people with accurate data, it doesn't really matter if your buses run on time. I'm not saying that's true, but wouldn't that be an interesting question to have an answer to as you go into your next service planning exercise? Um, and then informing planning efforts. So, you know, two big ones, uh, ride hail, micromobility, how do they complement existing networks? How do scooters and bikes and Uber and Lyft and all of the others complement the existing networks right now? And if you're going into a redesign then, how do they begin to, and how do you think about how that's going to work going forward, and how do you understand where people, if you understand where people actually live and where they work, where they're coming from and going to, and where they play, and all of the trips that they're taking, does that inform your network design in a different way than what you know right now, which is how they interact with your network given the network that you already have? Quick things, um, just to sort of point to where some of these can be. So this was uh, about a year and a half ago. There were some big disruptions in Chicago on the L. Uh, and what you can see is that um, essentially bikes ended up not replacing the L for that, but uh, increased the, the usage of the Divi system by, by two and a half times on transit. So you could see that in that case, um, the bicycle network became essentially a source of resilience um, for the rest of the transit network and became part of it. Um, and then lastly, um, I, I had to end on something that uh, I participated in uh, when I was uh, at the MBTA in Boston, but was also part of transit, which is uh, research efforts. Because I think that on a, on a level of the individual agency, it's very interesting. But I think that banded together and thinking about this as an industry as a whole and thinking about how we can begin to use this data, uh, I think we can change um, a little bit our entire knowledge base um, of how people are actually using the systems that we spend so much time and effort and put so much love into running. Um, and so this is a partnership between uh, the MBTA and the Boston Area Research Initiative and Transit to use 
the data that transit provides the MBTA to begin to understand and to build tools to better analyze that data, but then to understand things like implicit bias and understanding and making sure that that data is representative of the entire users, the user base, so that as people go forward, uh, they can think about it. Doing analysis to understand the resilience of the system to disruptions and how people react to disruptions, but then also opening it up in an aggregated form for social science questions that go beyond transportation. Because the reason that we're all in transportation, the reason that we love it, it may be because we have a love affair with trains and buses and, you know, like getting our hands dirty with diesel engines and all of those sort of fun things. But a lot of it comes from what transportation means. And transport people don't ride trains and buses except for probably the people in this room because they like riding trains and buses. They ride it to get to other places. They ride it to do the things that they want to do in their life, whether it's go to work or whether it's take their kid to a ball game or whether it's to go to a medical appointment. Um, and they're trying to do that. And so the data that we slough off from the systems that we produce is something that may be able to actually change a little bit more of how we understand the world around us and not just the transportation system.